So good morning and thanks so much for coming out this early in the morning um, to attend our panel on, on Greek literature. As you know, this is a session of uh, lightning talks, which means that each presenter is going to talk for about six minutes and then we're going to have a discussion um, about the paper and about whatever other broader uh, uh, topic comes up for about 20 minutes and then we'll move on to the next paper. Um, I should let you know right now that uh, this session is being recorded and it will become available online. Um, so that's why there's a camera over there. Um, this means that it would help immensely if you could come up to the microphone to ask your questions. Just keep that in mind. Um, and, um, you know, it's up to you if you want to do it or not. Um, all right, so without uh, further ado, let's turn to our first speaker, Amy Lather. Amy is an assistant professor of classics at Wake Forest University. She has published articles on artificial intelligence, uh, musical aesthetics, and sense experience in archaic Greek poetry and Attic tragedy. And she has a forthcoming monograph with Edinburgh University Press entitled Matters of the Mind, Materiality and Aesthetics in Ancient Greek Thought. Today, Amy will talk to us about thinking with things, mitis, as extended cognition. Let's welcome Amy. Thank you, Zoe, for that. Um, and just before I start, so within my paper, I'm going to be presenting this idea in very broad strokes. But on the handout, which hopefully has come around, Oh, it's okay. <laughs> so on the handout, I've included the full passages that I'm referring to. So if you want to talk in detail about those, we can certainly do that in the q and <clears throat> I'll give the handouts a second to come around. Oh, does it need to be down? Okay, okay. It's up there. I don't want to hit my face on it. <laughs> It's uncontroversial to claim that Matus is a form of intelligence that excels in the practical sphere. Matus, which has by now become almost as synonymous with Detienne and Vernant as with Athena, Odysseus, and the like, is what Janet Lloyd terms cunning intelligence in her translation of Detienne and Vernant's landmark study. And this well captures what is so fundamental to Matus, its remarkable dexterity with craft, including the crafting of ruses and traps. In this paper, I want to propose a new way to look at this relationship between Matus and craft by situating it within the framework of extended cognition. In doing so, we will find that Matus offers a particularly illustrative domain in which we can see cognitive processes become highly integrated with their material environs. I focus here on three main figures, Hermes, Odysseus, and Prometheus, not because these are the only purveyors of Matus in Greek thought, but because archaic literature preserves lengthy, detailed accounts of how each thinks through and with things. Interpreting these accounts through the lens of extended cognition will thus enable us to see that Hermes, Odysseus, and Prometheus are exemplars of how the mind can be supersized, to use the term of one of the originators of the extended mind thesis, Andy Clark. To understand what he means by supersizing or extending cognition, we can look at the example used in the original formulation of this thesis, the case of Otto versus Inga, which is summarized in passage one. In this thought experiment, both Otto and Inga want to visit the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. Inga recalls the address of the museum and makes her way there without a hitch. Otto, however, suffers a mild form of Alzheimer's and so carries with him at all times a notebook that contains within it information he knows he might need. He consults the notebook and finds his way to the museum just as easily as Inga. The point of this comparison is that Otto's notebook is just as fundamental to his thought and decision-making as Inga's memory is to hers. The only difference is that Inga's is an internal brain-bound resource, while Otto's is an external physical prop. But take away Inga's memory or Otto's notebook, and each would be equally impaired from completing the same task. Clark and David Chalmers, with whom he formulated the original paper, concludes, quote, Otto's internal processes and his notebook constitute a single cognitive system. For Otto, notebook entries play just the sort of role that beliefs play in guiding most people's lives. 
This thesis is, of course, not without controversy, but for us classical philologists, its appeal lies, I think, in its alterity and how it offers an innovative way of reading ancient Greek minds. In what follows, I will sketch briefly how I think Hermes, Odysseus, and Prometheus exercise their matis in forms of extended cognition. To do this, I'll focus on how each of these figures succeeds in repurposing materials to fulfill specific needs. For by imagining new ways to use well-known materials, each character illustrates how their matis finds form in the phenomenal world. Without access to such materials, Matus would be as deprived as Otto without his notebook. Let's start with Hermes' portrayal in the Homeric Hymn to Hermes. Its central narrative places Hermes' cunning at center stage by relating his theft of Apollo's cattle and the subsequent face-off between the deities. But this theft, together with Hermes' sacrifice of two of the cattle and the eventual reconciliation between the gods, is only possible because Hermes' cunning can find expression in his marvelous creations. He invents sandals to conceal his tracks, develops fire sticks to roast the cattle meat, and uses the lyre as a peace offering to placate Apollo. In each instance, Hermes takes things in his immediate environment and reinvents them, as, we, as are uh, summarized in passages 2a through c. Whittling branches just so allows them to become fire starters. Tamarisk and myrtle twigs can be woven together into footwear, and a tortoise's shell and sheep's guts become the lyre. While Hermes forges each creation very swiftly, they are no less artful for that. This hymn, by detailing at length the construction of each invention, makes it clear that Hermes' cunning is anything but brain-bound. Instead, his matis manifests itself here in his close attentiveness to existing materials and, crucially, in his ability to skillfully refashion these into objects that both reflect and refract his cunning. Similarly, we can see Prometheus's ruse with the sacrificial offering to Zeus as an extension of his matis. The Theogony, and this is in passage 3a, relates that Prometheus presented to Zeus two sacrificial offerings, and in order to preserve meat as the human share, Prometheus put out the bones of the white, put out the white bones of the ox, having dressed them up with cunning skill and covered them with shining fat in order to make Zeus choose that one. By treating the fat as something that can be cunningly wrought, Prometheus reimagines the sacrificial fat as a functional material not unlike silver or gold. Indeed, Prometheus's cunning is precisely what Zeus spies when he looks at the offering and sees that it is tricked out craftily, as we see in passage 3b. In other words, Zeus doesn't see the fat as fat, but sees the offering as an extension of Prometheus's deceptive intent. Without Prometheus's ability to repurpose the fat in this way, in addition to the fennel stalk that he uses to steal fire, his matis would be stymied. We can conclude with a brief look at Odysseus and one of the objects most closely associated with him, his marriage bed. And there's a lengthy description of that in passage four. This is the final token through which Penelope comes to recognize Odysseus, and the centrality of this object to his marriage is embodied in the olive tree that forms the linchpin of his bed and bedchamber. In narrating its construction, Odysseus emphasizes how I myself and no other man made it a statement that makes clear that Odysseus sees the bed not only as a symbol of his marriage, but as a steadfast feature of his own identity. This example, and the special significance attached to this bed, places the connection between mind and material at center stage. This is a connection that I think is fundamental to the examples of Matus discussed here, where each character's cunning physically and fluently extends into the world in the objects they fashion. In these accounts of Matus, I suggest, we gain a particularly clear perspective on the mind-transforming power of material things. Thank you. So, happy to take questions. Yes, questions, comments? I can start. Sure. Here's the ball right here. Um, thank you very much. I find this uh, very stimulating, your ideas. Um, and thank you. I was wondering, um, so, what do you make of the fact that, um, in the case of Prometheus, for instance, mm -hmm. and of Hermes too, mm -hmm. um, there is a the first invention to come from theology, mm -hmm. like reputation, yeah, but the intention may or may not 
remain the same. So yeah, I yeah. don't know what you do, how you bridge the two. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, in the longer version of this paper, I think I actually suggest that Prometheus is sort of the father of extended intelligence because he gives, or he's supposed to have given fire to humans, which then enables them to craft um, tools and methods of craftsmanship, you know, distinct from whatever he's brought to humankind. So I think, in fact, um, that that humans take these things like the fire starters or fire or the lyre or whatever and do different things with them is in fact just an extension of this original process of taking things that were you know totally kind of useless before and turning them into something that can produce music or produce fire and have uh, this very um, particular particular function in in life. But yeah, that's a really that's good question. Yeah, I was more thinking about the sacrificial portion. Mm -hmm. that that starts as a dolos, as you yeah, know, yeah. your passage is uh, it's very mm -hmm. explicit in the mm -hmm. original. Um, but then it's turned around to be like an offering. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wonder, that seems to be a little, kind of a category by itself. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, one of the important features of um, that passage is that, um, you know, this process of overlay is the same um, process that we see in the analogy um, in the Odyssey where Athena uh, beautifies Odysseus and she's compared to Hephaestus overlaying silver with gold. So I think even in the construction of the dolos, it's still sort of situated within this realm of manual craftsmanship. Um, so I think, I think in fact that the, the dolos, this, this trick is sort of like an extreme version of the kinds of tricks and tools that any craftsman uses, if that makes sense. But that's a that is an important distinction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually like, uh, particularly the liar example, much better than I like Clark and uh, Palmer. <laughs> They've always seemed to me to push this too far mm -hmm. because the woman who remembers how to get somewhere. Mm -hmm can in fact deal with the detour mm. he has to. Mm -hmm. She has the full range of mental capacity. The notebook mm -hmm. gives you only what's in the notebook. Right, yeah. Um, but the liar, on the other mm -hmm. hand, um, becomes the stimulus for ever more mm -hmm. creative activity. Mm -hmm. The one I kind of wonder about is the bed. Okay, so is the, the bed, bed okay. is the product of man. Mm -hmm. um, it has always bothered me that Penelope um, regards the bed as an adequate test. <laughs> She's actually worried that the stranger is a god uh -huh. because a god could not. Mm -hmm. But what a god, I think, she thinks, could not do mm -hmm. was get angry. Uh -huh. What a god cannot do is react the mm -hmm. way Odysseus reacts. And that puts the whole thing back into a very profound level of human cognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People are better, even than gods, at thinking yeah. about the minds of people that they know well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it goes through the material object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think one thing um, that sets Odysseus apart, um, uh, you know, in addition to being mortal, is the fact that he's I think exceptionally fluent at sort of reading the minds of other people and knowing how to react or how to not react. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's a that's a really interesting point. Um, and as for um, Clark and Chalmers. So I didn't have time to go into all of this here, um, but I just wanted to start with Clark and Chalmers, although in the, in the longer version, I also talk about Lambros Maliforis, um, who has a theory of material engagement, where it's not just that material props are kind of passive aids in cognitive processes, but actually something like the form of the notebook, right? And that you record things with a pen or a pencil, that those material specificities actually shape how humans then conceive of their own memories and process of remembering. So I think pairing those two um, makes makes good sense for Matus, right? Because as they craft these things, 
um, you know, starting with going to the, the liar example. First, you have to kill the tortoise and sort of hollow it out. And with each step, more possibilities um, become apparent, right? And it becomes this more sophisticated thing. It's not just that Hermes is like, oh, I have this idea, blah, 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 and it's, you know, the perfect finished thing. So, yeah, that, that point is well taken. Is it working? Okay. Yes. Thank you for the Thanks. talk. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to Pandora mm -hmm. being created yeah. as um, a sheer dollar yes. for yes. mankind. Just anything at yeah. all would be great. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that Pandora is explicitly the price to pay for fire, and, um, you know, in the fire example, that's just a case of Prometheus seeing the fennel stalk as, oh, this is a thing with a, you know, a hard exterior and a hollow interior, so therefore I can conceal the fire in it. So it makes sense then that in the description of Pandora's creation, right, she's this beautiful exterior with these things hidden inside. So it's sort of the inverse, but um, I think it's, it's um, Zeus recognizing that trick with the fire for what it is, which is um, the fact that surface appearances of materials are, need uh, not be what they seem. Right? So I think that there's a really strong um, correlation between how both the fire trick and Pandora are supposed to work. And of course, you know, um, Pandora, um, especially in the, in the works and days description, you know, she's designed specifically to prey on the fallibilities of um, male cognition, right? That they can't, they can't uh, get a glimpse of these unsavory qualities within her. They're so beguiled by this, by this spectacular appearance. So that's why I was I think just to like kind of add on there, mm -hmm. is she not a tool in some sense yes. herself? Yes, yeah, right? I like think she's yeah. She's going to like the liar, I guess, produce mm -hmm. other things. I know that's not really what's emphasized mm -hmm. by Hesiod. Yeah. Is that she's going to be a mother or anything. Yeah. But I think that's what is implicit in yeah. what, you know, what she's about. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it just may also be that then, then people use mm -hmm. Pandora mm -hmm. like, in the same way they're going to use fire or whatever. Yeah. You know, to, to create. Yeah, yeah. She does mention her mm -hmm. weaving ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right that she contributes in that way. That's a that's a great point. And I think the other thing too, in another way that she's a corollary or the sort of inverse of fire is, whereas fire is this great help to mankind, Pandora is designed to be to operate in this closely coupled relationship with humans, but it's just a bad one, right? Um, she's going to bring banes to, to mankind, but um, she's nevertheless this integral part of human life now. So yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yes. I, uh, again, uh, similarly with the liar, mm -hmm. um, it seems like what, one of the ways to... Is there, is there a kind of distinction that we might want to make between... Um, just tools in general, and hmm. those which those objects which enable this kind of extended cognition, hmm. and, and that is objects which enable one to think uh, in some new way, produce new thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, a liar, perhaps most obviously, mm -hmm. enables one to in, uh, with one's body to mm -hmm. think in a different way. So, yeah. to, to, yeah. so if anybody you know who's played an instrument can. Mm -hmm. can appreciates the way in which the physical use of the instrument enables one to um, produce new music, new creative things mm -hmm. in a way that, that if you just was stuck in your own mind, you wouldn't necessarily yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it doesn't, that's not emphasized in the, as far as I can recall, mm -hmm. in, in the Hermes, you probably have to look elsewhere for, for the use of musical instruments to just, um, in that description. Um, but it seems like that maybe in some ways is different from something like the the um, bed or the the fat mm -hmm. um, trick that Prometheus plays, in, insofar as it actually enables this new kind of thought. Mm -hmm. I mean, the closest something that ends up being more like the loom, which mm -hmm. uh, Pen mm -hmm. uh, Penelope's weaving or other kinds of weaving that that enables one to to, to um, create new mm -hmm. new um, objects. Think you know. And actually physically manipulating it, you get, you're able to do something different, perhaps. Yeah. Think, think differently through the medium than uh, just in your own brain. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I agree that the lyre is not purely functional, um, but I think it does, like the loom, um, require this heightened awareness of your body's engagement with the instrument. Because when Hermes gives it to Apollo, he says, you know, he has this metaphor uh, comparing uh, the lyre to a tyrant, saying you have to, you know, play her gently. If you don't play her skillfully, she'll just babble nonsense. Um, but with the right uh, touch, as it were, um, she'll produce beautiful music. So I think... Um, I think it does, uh, th this hymn does show awareness of how playing a musical instrument does require this different kind of kinesthetic awareness um, that's maybe on par with what a weaver needs in manipulating the loom or um, somebody like Hephaestus in working at the forge. But I agree that it's, it's, not, um, purely, it's not purely a means to an end the way something like the fat maybe is. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested... Presumably, Otto's notebook is idiosyncratic, right? Mm -hmm. so you take it mm -hmm. away from him, and it may be of functional value mm -hmm. to someone else, but certainly depreciated, mm -hmm. right? Whereas the other ones are more towards manuals, like Zoe was pointing out, the iteration. I wondered if, you, if that distinction were helpful to cover an example like Odysseus talking about his clothes to fashion a lie mm -hmm. that Penelope believes, where he takes his personal notebook, as it were, to use it as an implement to create a dull loss, and that if, made, if the distinctions were meaningful, I couldn't help but think of the Christopher Nolan film Memento, where mm, he's taking mm -hmm, Polaroid mm -hmm. photos to construct a past for himself yeah. that can be detached from him and manipulated, and, and the degree to which Matus kind of controls mm -hmm. your reception and your ability to invent and, and reinvent your, well, in Odysseus's case, himself. Yeah. And then secondarily, <laughs> <laughs> the issue of you couldn't possibly build a liar from the yeah, description yes, you're giving yes. poetry. And these are all second order reiterations mm -hmm. of these uh, is events in terms mm -hmm. of kind of cultural memory mm -hmm. where that might situate the text as a repository of mm -hmm. technical information. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. These are great questions. So I'll start with the, the second one. I mean, um, I think actually the fact that it's not a technically accurate description and that it's highly compressed. Um, I actually take in support of this view that it shows how tightly um, coupled he is with his environment because, you know, he works so swiftly that, you know, um, the steps are sort of um, compressed, right? And the poet narrates it as such. I think that compression of the language gives that impression. Um, but, um, and then as for it not being accurate and how that relates to sort of cultural awareness, um, Athanasios Vergatos, uh, uh, in his extensive commentary on this, he points out that, yeah, it's not accurate, but it seems to be a description that would have been would have been most intelligible to an audience, right? And I think that that too is a way of making clear, you know, what exactly Hermes is is doing and how his cunning is finding expression in this thing that we all know and love and are listening to possibly right now. Um, and then as to the, the first question, the idiosyncratic nature, I think that's that's really important um, for, uh, for Odysseus and I think for the Clark and Chalmers thesis. And again, I think Odysseus is sort of um, not an outlier, but he's sort of a standout in this respect because as you mentioned with the bed and the clothes, I mean, he really does, he has more sort of bespoke objects um, than Prometheus and Hermes who are sort of we're creating prototypes um, of things that go on to be refashioned and reworked um, in, the, in the human sphere. So certainly I think the idiosyncratic nature and the fact that you know, it's linked to one person and no one else um, strengthens that relationship between the individual and whatever material it is. And if you know, for somebody like Penelope, who's aware of that connection, then that relationship becomes, becomes a, a thing by which recognition can be affected, right? Precisely because these objects are linked to one person and, and nobody else. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think what's curious about this is that couples of clothes, right? Mm -hmm. It creates Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I focus specifically on the repurposing of, of things, and that's, you know, a prime example of that, as you, as you recognize, is with Odysseus and the clothes. It's not creating something wholesale, but finding um, new purposes for these things to suit whatever, whatever aim wants to be accomplished, right? Um, Otto could have used his notebook as a doorstop if he needed to, right? Um, it would still be his, his notebook. Um, I don't think, you know, that would, that would change the relationship between his cognitive process and, you know, the contents of the notebook. But I, I think, um, you know, the fact that the notebook had previously existed as a memory aid and it's now this other thing, I don't think that that diminishes the notebook's potential as a cognitive prop, if that makes sense, right? Um, because the point is, is that it's, it's, it's his, and even if he primarily relies on it as a, as a memory aid, um, that doesn't mean that it can't be something else in, in the future. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Sure. Mm -hmm. And this is probably one of the best um, pieces mm -hmm. of questions. Um, you know, what's going to change for you? I'm really interested in the structure of the scripture. You're told to make something else that can make samples. Um, but then, you know, the next one, you know, add faster, analyze, you can't even think Yeah, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. And which you know, I'm struggling to find a good definition of um, uh -huh. in, in this book. Um, I just wondered if, if you could kind of outline um, where we are in the process of you know, making a tool from something which isn't clever, which is mm -hmm. a tool, and that we can repurpose it, and we're not just using it, and we're not protecting it. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of outline um, from these, those, the, these three passages from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, in it, just to clarify, in two C, it is it is clear that he's going to make the liar uh, because before this passage begins, he spied the the tortoise and brought it inside, and he had said to the tortoise, "You will sing very beautifully." So there is indication. Um, so starting with the, the sandals, yeah, so the auto uh, trapezos, um, so that conveys the sense of improvisation, but clearly it's not entirely improvised, right? Because he had had the time to pick these particular plants before his journey, right? So he knew he was gonna do something with them, and then he takes this existing technique, weaving, right? He, he picked these plants that specifically he could tie together and put under his feet, repurposes weaving for that, and then you know, the, the, the material presence of the sandals themselves actually turns out to be somewhat tangential, right? Because he wants them because of the bizarre tracks they're going to leave behind. When he's finished, he throws them in the river, right? So it, throws, so it confuses Apollo. Um, um, so, so that one, I think, is, the, is sort of the most unusual of the three from this hymn. Um, and then as with, I think, 2A and C are probably the most similar, um, because you know you sort of know where they're going from the beginning, and um, each passage narrates it very step by step in a way that I think makes you see how one alteration or one choice sort of leads necessarily to another, and so you see this logical progression and how you know this particular type of wood using this particular technique of, of whittling and this way of moving one stick into the other, ah, like, of course, that, that gives you this technique that we all know and love. Um, and I think, um, even though, as we mentioned, the, the liar's construction, the description of that, while that's not technically accurate, um, as I said, I think it's, um, it's composed in a way that makes it intelligible, right? Because people are familiar with the basic form of the liar, even if not the specificities of what it actually takes to make it. Um, so I hope that goes some way towards answering your question. Okay. Well, let's, uh, thank you. Thank you.